By 9 ABY, five years after the devastating Imperial defeat at the Battle of Endor, the Galactic Empire, the once dominant hegemonic power within the galaxy, was on the verge of total collapse. After the liberation of Coruscant from Imperial control, and the expulsion of the Empire's presence within the core worlds of the galaxy, three years earlier in 6 ABY, the Galactic Empire lost its status as a galactic government, engulfed by the growing flame of the New Republic. The standing once enjoyed under the reign of Emperor Palpatine had been all but lost. True Imperial influence was reduced to small fragments and dispersed star systems throughout the galaxy. What the Galactic Empire lacked in territory was overshadowed by what it lacked in leadership, as much of Imperial space following the death of Palpatine wasn't ruled and unified under a single leader, but rather was reduced to warlordism whereby Imperial territory was shared among competing warlords. With the death of Warlord Zin Jadathomir in 8 ABY, the Empire seemed destined to exist only within the pages of galactic history. Although the Imperial territories were nominally overseen by the Imperial Ruling Council, the warlords within Imperial space succumbed to endless squabbling, with a complete failure to achieve anything close to a unified front to once again bring Imperial leadership to the galaxy at large. Many warlords were happy to adopt a position of isolationism, hoping to hold on to their meager territories within the Outer Rim if it meant avoiding the attention of the New Republic, and a similar fate to those warlords who were killed in their quest for glory. Needless to say, as most of the Moths lived in perpetual fear of not just the New Republic, but also one another, the days of the Galactic Empire, now reduced to only 25% of its former territories, seem numbered. However, a visionary leader lay in waiting within the unknown regions of the galaxy. A leader who wouldn't fight merely for personal power and sparse territories like the warlords had in his absence. No, he would fight and dedicate himself to one single goal, the only goal worth pursuing. The complete, total, and utter destruction of the rebellion. This leader was none other than Thrawn the last of the Galactic Empire's Grand Admirals from the days of Emperor Palpatine. Declaring the Unknown Regions to be sufficiently pacified, Thrawn re-emerged from the Unknown Regions to rejoin the Imperial Remnant. For Galactic historians, the exact reason for Thrawn's return was a hotly debated topic. For some, it was argued that the clone of Palpatine gaining power on the Deep Core planet of Biss had recalled Thrawn to restore the glory of the Empire, in preparation for Palpatine's own return to the galaxy. Others argued that Thrawn recognized that the New Republic was incapable of defending against what he saw as the inevitable attack by those from outside of the galaxy, eventually recognized to be the Yuuzhan Vong. What wasn't up for debate, however, was that the Grand Admiral's return to the known galaxy would prove to be one of the most trying times for the New Republic. To start the process of uniting the fragmented forces of the Empire, Thrawn's first action was to send an encrypted holographic transmission to the Imperial II-class Star Destroyer named Chimera, which was received by Captain Peleon, the ship's commanding officer. Given that the Chimera was regarded as one of the most efficiently run Star Destroyers in the years following the Battle of Endor, there's no secret why Thrawn chose this particular vessel. Having announced his return to Captain Peleon, Thrawn provided coordinates in which the Star Destroyer could rendezvous with his shuttle. Upon his boarding of the Chimera, Thrawn made the Star Destroyer his flagship and named Peleon as his second-in-command. Recognizing how dire the situation was for the Empire, with the Imperial forces on the verge of collapse, Thrawn first dedicated himself to uniting and rebuilding the splintered elements of the Galactic Empire. Upon taking command of the Chimera in AABY, Thrawn's first action was to rally the Empire's Moths, doing so by declaring himself to the Imperial Ruling Council. 
Demonstrating his tactical and strategic genius, he earned the support of many of the imperial officers. Having impressed and earned their admiration, the remnant of the imperial forces agreed to the creation of a military confederation that came to be known as Thrawn's Confederation or even Thrawn's Empire. The Grand Admiral was made both the confederation's head of state and commander-in-chief, obtaining the new title of Supreme Commander. Thrawn succeeded in reuniting the remnants of the Galactic Empire and numerous independent imperial factions and warlords. Chief among these member factions were the remnants of the Galactic Empire overseen by the Imperial Ruling Council, the Pentastar Alignment ruled by Grand Moff Cain, the Corellian Sector ruled by Dictat Gallenby, the Sayutric Hegemony ruled by Prince Admiral Krennel, the Oplovis Sector ruled by Fleet Admiral Drommel, and the Anti-Meridian Sector ruled by Moff Jatelis. For the first time in years, Thrawn succeeded in bringing the vast majority of Imperial resources together, unified by the common goal of destroying the New Republic. However, despite these successes, the reality of the situation was that these fragmented elements were still slow to give up their old practices. Many of the Imperial warlords and moths continued to hoard their military assets out of fear of losing their territories with some remaining committed to isolation despite their alliance with Thrawn. In truth, Thrawn was starved of military assets and resources. The Chiss Grand Admiral was only in control of a fleet that was reduced to just a dozen Star Destroyers, which in addition to the Chimera, only half could be judged as completely loyal to Thrawn. Thrawn would assign these six loyal Star Destroyers to comprise his own personal fleet while the remaining six formed a second fleet under the command of Captain Dorja. Also, joining the Armada would be a number of Strike and Carrot class cruisers, and the Starfighter complements of each vessel. Understanding the situation that he was in, Thrawn accepted the state of affairs with calm and composure. Despite the lack of resources, he assured Captain Pelion that they were ready to initiate the opening stages of their campaign, given that it would require relatively few warships. Although being severely handicapped due to the lack of ships and trained personnel, Thrawn relished the challenge facing him. He immediately reinstated training programs to ensure that his inexperienced crews, with many being conscripted under duress by threat of force, were brought up to speed as quickly and effectively as possible. Rookie personnel were teamed with older, more experienced officers within Thrawn's academies, which were being filled with new recruits thanks to a revitalization program put in place by Thrawn in preparation for the coming campaign. These new training efforts were so effective that by the time Thrawn launched his campaign in 9 ABY, the personnel comprising the Imperial fleet were fully and adequately trained whereby the most unconventional and daunting maneuvers, such as micro-jumps through hyperspace, became routine. Naturally, Thrawn ensured that the best and most promising personnel were transferred to his own personal fleet and served aboard his flagship Chimera. In addition to the increase in personnel, Thrawn also initiated a new program of rearmament, ordering the creation of new ships and weapons. As a result of this program, the Empire's production capacity was invigorated, resulting in the production of new ships then made available to Thrawn's Confederation, as well as the creation of new models, such as the Scimitar Assault Bomber. However, these efforts were used in the defense of the Imperial member worlds and to reinforce the planet of Orinda as the seat of Imperial power, thereby allowing the Moths to feel adequately defended while Thrawn committed to his campaign. Therefore, Thrawn's own personal fleet remained restricted to only six Star Destroyers. But again, these were viewed to be sufficient by Thrawn, and he was ready to commence the preliminary stages of his campaign against the New Republic. In the next episode, we'll look at the opening moves Thrawn made in his campaign against the New Republic, looking at the innovative military maneuvers he executed that represented the first major threat to the New Republic's consolidation of galactic power, pushing the fledgling democracy to the brink of collapse. In episode 2, we'll also look at why Thrawn referred to his offensive as the Mount Tantis campaign, 
given the crucial elements that Thrawn discovered that had been locked away within Emperor Palpatine's private and secret storage facility located within Mount Tantis on the planet of Waylon. A series like this is a direct result of the support of our Patreons. Thank you to all of the Patreons of Star Wars Reading Club for making Thrawn's re-emergence and War Against the New Republic a complete history possible. If you'd like to support our work, please consider becoming a patron of the channel through Patreon for access to exclusive hangouts and book discussions. Thank you for watching everyone, and as always, may the Force be with you.